This is Plant-Based Briefing, Zoonotic Disease and Animal Welfare in the U.S., Part 1, by Kristen A. Stilt and Bonnie Nadzim at Phonolytics.org. And I'm Marian Erickson. This is the Curated Content Plant-Based Podcast, where I narrate a variety of articles on plant-based and vegan living with permission in about 10 minutes or less every weekday. And today's article is longer than that, so it's a two-parter. I'm reading Part 1 today, and Part 2 will be tomorrow. It's from Phonolytics. I have permission to read their content. They're a nonprofit providing animal advocates with data to understand how people think about and respond to advocacy, and they provide the best strategies to inspire change for animals. Today's article is a summary of a recent study that was published September 20th, 2023, by Kristen A. Stilt and Bonnie Nadzum of Harvard Law School. So now let's get to today's plant based briefing. Zoonotic Disease and Animal Welfare in the U.S., Part 1, by Kristen A. Stilt and Bonnie Nadzim at Phonolytics.org. This blog explores a U.S. report about the health risks of animal commerce, how it's linked to animal welfare, and what advocates can do about it. Animals Industries, Consumption, and Disease The U.S. produces over 10 billion land animals each year for human consumption and imports more farmed animals annually, over 22 million, than any other country. At present, however, there is no universal disease testing of farmed animals in the U.S., whether domestic or imported. And while the U.S. is also the world's number one importer of wild animals, over 200 million per year, many of these wild animals enter the country without disease testing or any kind of physical inspection. These facts are particularly poignant on this side of COVID-19, a pandemic with a death toll just under 7 million at the time of writing, and which is unwise to think of as a one-time disaster. In fact, disease experts worry that it could be dwarfed by future zoonotic pandemics, particularly those caused by influenza viruses, such as the ongoing avian flu, H5N1. H5N1 has not yet spread among humans, but it is being detected among other mammals in increasing numbers. Since non-human mammals are closer genetically to humans than birds are to humans, this may mean the virus is inching closer to infecting humans. Research performed at Stanford University suggests that an H5N1 outbreak could cause as many as a billion human deaths. These facts are just a few of the many troubling observations about animal industries, consumption, and disease risk in the United States. Together with our colleagues at NYU's Center for Environmental and Animal Protection and Harvard Law's Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program, we explored some of these concerns in a report on 36 major American animal industries, from factory farming to the trade in exotic companion animals. In our report, we analyze the threat each industry contributes to zoonotic disease risk and, in turn, how it threatens all of us. The report serves as a helpful resource for advocates and policymakers who wish to improve both human and animal health and welfare. The story behind our report. We began this work in 2020 when COVID-19 emerged as a pandemic. At that time, there were respected scientists and policymakers in the U.S. and elsewhere calling for the closure of live animal or wet markets around the world, especially in China. A live animal market in Wuhan remains the contested and suspected site of the initial transference of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to humans. Live animal markets are indeed crucial sites for detecting zoonotic disease and preventing pandemics, but calling for the closure of all animal markets or for closures in only certain geographic regions meant to us that the law and policy dialogue was not yet engaging the issues of live animal markets effectively. Initially, there were five questions driving our research, which we have now investigated across 15 countries. They were as follows. Number one, explore the international landscape of live animal markets. First, we understood that while the policy focus was on markets in China, live markets exist all over the world, including the U.S., Central and South America, and in Africa and Europe. Given the ability for viruses to spread widely from anywhere they originate, a comprehensive approach to live animal markets must be international to be effective. Number two, clarify the terms and definitions related to live animal markets. Second, it was clear that no one really understood what was meant when referring to wet markets and live animal markets, and the term wildlife was being used without differentiating between commercially bred or farmed wild animals and animals caught in the wild in their native habitats. Number three, understand the context and role of live animal markets. Third, policy conversations focusing on banning or shutting down live markets disregarded the complex socioeconomic reasons they exist and the roles they serve, factors that must be understood and addressed in any regulatory response. Who supplies the animals? Who are the customers? 
what economic, cultural, social, or other motivations have led to the supply and demand for these animals in these markets. Number four, assess the status quo of regulations. Fourth, we wondered what governmental actors at all levels were already doing to regulate or restrict live animal markets. How broad or narrow was the scope of existing efforts? And number five, investigate the absence of global regulatory action. Finally, we wanted to interrogate why it was so, if indeed it was the case, that most governmental actors worldwide have so far failed to act effectively regarding disease risks among live animal markets. We began with a narrow focus, defining live animal markets as locations where, like the market in Wuhan, animals are stored alive, then slaughtered on site for sale to customers as food. But it quickly became apparent that we needed to broaden our scope. This proved as instructive for us as we believe it should be for policymakers. While live animal markets are indeed high-risk sites for zoonotic transmission, it is clear they are only part of a tangled web of supply chains moving and mixing many species in poor health and intense confinement within countries and internationally. As such, our investigations came to employ a broader understanding of live animal markets to mean almost any place where the consumption and use of animals brings them into contact with humans in such a way that zoonotic disease can spread. In this broader and more accurate sense, live animal markets include, for example, slaughterhouses, fur farms, petting zoos, pet stores, circuses, big game hunting, and upland bird farming. Our study of the U.S. is the first portion of the research that we have made public. It details ways in which the U.S.'s widespread, under-regulated animal industries could lead to new animal-to-human zoonotic pandemics. The fact is there is no single geographic region or demographic group exclusively responsible for the spread of zoonotic disease. How U.S. Animal Markets Pose a Disease Risk We're surprised by what we've found, as much by the sheer scale and diversity of animal use in the U.S., as by the disconnected patchwork of federal, state, and municipal laws governing animal industries. Some are underregulated, and others are totally unregulated. Across many animal industries in the U.S., economic incentives cause disease risk to be overlooked in favor of revenue. And where self-interest and public interest point in opposite directions, regulation and enforcement are needed to ensure that producers follow best practices. The fact is, we are selling and consuming animals and their body parts and products in the absence of such regulation and enforcement. In this environment, misaligned incentives tend to enhance risks to public health risks that occur across the supply chain, from the places where animals are born to the homes where they're consumed as food or kept as companions. You just listened to Zoonotic Disease and Animal Welfare in the U.S. Part 1 by Kristen A. Stilt and Bonnie Nadzim at faunalytics.org. And I'm your host, Marian Erickson. Tune in tomorrow for the second half of this episode, where you'll hear some interesting information about farming and slaughter and hunting in the game meat industry as well as how to use this research to inform advocacy. And I'll also read the 36 major American animal industries that they explored in this study, which I found hard to believe there were 36. So tune in tomorrow for that, and please share this episode with anyone who might benefit, and thanks for listening.